And how did you wind up uh, in WCW that time? Like when you when you first came the first time? Right? I was in WCW before as the blonde cowboy gimmick underneath Jabroni guy. I was they had me. On, I wasn't even on a contract, but I was getting a grand a week on a verbal commitment, and just floundering, not getting anywhere. Not uh, what I my feeling about WCW was that your destiny was determined before you ever performed, because if you made seven hundred fifty grand a year. You know, your contract was negotiated before you performed, you know. So if you made seven hundred and fifty grand and I make fifty grand, I'm never gonna beat you. Yeah. I'm probably not even gonna be in the same match as you. Even though some of those high paid guys weren't that over and some of the lower paid guys were getting over with the people, that just you're you were pigeonholed into a certain position and you was, there was no advancement, you know, and it's not that the blonde haired guy was getting over it all down there. Yeah. But when uh, when I came back from Germany one tour, um, my wife, my then wife was pregnant and I called Diamond Dallas Page who had a good spot then and said, Dally man, I need a job. My wife's pregnant man, I need a job. Because I was ready to quit wrestling. I was going to go work at Sears or something. But now i got a baby and I need money quick. Yeah. And uh, so I called Dallas and, and I said, you need somebody to stand next to you and make you look small. I said, you need the diamond stud. Huh. So Dally gave me the black hair gimmick, told me to shave the mustache, he wanted me to have the Rob Lowe stubble, and it was even, our first TV was in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and we ate at a Waffle House right by the building, and we're checking out, paying our bill, and they had a little toothpick thing there, and Dallas went, toothpicks. So he said, well, we'll both have toothpicks. I went, all right. So we're walking, and we're, we're, Dallas used to talk on the way to the ring, he had a microphone, and we were doing this strip the stud gimmick, you know. <laughs> I'd tear away stuff on him. We're looking for a valet for the stud and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but Dallas was talking so much on the way to the ring, his toothpick fell out. And I still had mine. Uh -huh. And I went to that camera and went, bang. And then, and then the toothpick thing was mine. Wow. But uh, Dallas helped me so much. He drove me crazy, <laughs> but, he, but he helped me a lot. Because as soon as I did that stud gimmick, the first time I was on TV, Pat Patterson called my house and said, Vince loves the new look. Really? The first and, time? He said, did you sign a contract? And I said, Pat, I don't want to work for them. I said, I wouldn't have called your office every week for a year if I did. I said, I want to work for your office. He said, did you sign a contract? I said, yeah, I just got back from Atlanta. I signed a one-year contract. And he said, well, don't worry, kid. In a year, you'll be able to tell them New York wants you. Wow. All right, as far as uh, Dallas Page goes, I mean, Dallas has told stories where he was ribbed a lot, like when he was um, in WCW. Do you remember him being ribbed a lot back then? Yeah, I remember one time they had this dude, uh, Firebreaker Chip, I remember or something that. like that. And he was kind of a muscled up dude. And he was kind of ribbing Dally in the locker room. And a lot of people were giving Dallas stuff because, see, Dallas, in my opinion, Dallas didn't grasp the fact that to me if you're an announcer I always if you're an announcer I always viewed that as being above the wrestlers you know if you got the headsets on you're sitting there announcing that's kind of being above a wrestler but Dallas wanted to desperately wrestle hmm. and so he started wrestling and he was you know he was older than a lot of the guys had didn't have any experience but he had a burning desire and stuff and Dallas is Dallas man he's a kook he's eccentric I love him like a brother but he will drive you crazy if you don't know him. And he's just so upbeat and so positive and talking and doing it. And, and some guys just, some guys just, it's the nature of the business. Some guys are just mean, you know? Yeah. So one time the guy said something to Dallas, and I'll tell you what, Dallas face socked him and took him down on the floor. And from that minute on, all of a sudden everybody kind of went, whoa. Like, Oh, Phyllis Dill is tougher than he looks. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, a, a lot of the ribbing backed off then. But one time, I can't remember if it was in Charleston, West Virginia, or Morgantown, West Virginia, but we had a battle royal. And it was a managers were also in, in, in it. So Dallas was at that point still kind of managing the Diamond Stud. And Humperdinck was in it and stuff like that. So before the match, everybody but Dallas knew that the Steiner brothers were going to strip Dallas naked in the ring. And Dallas is one of the guys who wear three or four pair of tights, like spandex, long ones, short ones, under tights, everything. And, and then that's when Dallas was with the Freebirds too. He was managing the birds, he was managing me, he was with Humberdink. And, but the thing is, 
So we get in the ring, and I'm one of the first ones eliminated. So I'm standing in the back watching with Grizzly Smith. He was, yeah. the, he was the agent. And everybody, as soon as the thing starts, the people who Dallas manages, and the birds, Michael Hayes, everybody just turns around and everybody just starts wailing on Dallas. Just, I mean, some of them are live rounds, and they just start beating him down. And then the Steiners just swoop in and take him down, boom. And there's a big dog pile on him. Yeah. And the next thing you know, it was one of the most amazing feats of strength I've ever seen. Rick Steiner, you know, Robbie Rick Steiner, reached down and grabbed Dallas's spandex and just pulled on it, pulled on it. And spandex is pretty tough. Yeah. And he pulled on, pulled on, and just went wow till it exploded. It's wow. Now Dallas is butt ass naked in the middle of the ring. The people go crazy. <laughs> they are exploding. They're popping like crazy. <laughs> Then the funniest thing some people said was more revolting than seeing Dallas naked was Humperdinck took his Bad Street shirt off oh. and threw it to Dallas. <laughs> a lot of people went, oh my god, whoa. Because I don't know what's worse, Hump, Hump with his shirt off or Dallas naked. But Hump gave him shirt, so Dallas is holding his shirt around like this. And Grizzly says, go get him. So I go get him. The one thing, see, me and Dallas would butt heads about is to me, okay, I wouldn't want to be stripped naked in a ring. But if you are, you might as well go with it, right? I mean, you might as well go like, oh my God, ah, ah. And really, because the people were popping, but Dallas did it like, you know, big thing, you know? Like, yeah. if he went, ah, ah, they would have still been popping today. Yeah. But he did the, you know, you know like hmm. he didn't want to sell it, you know? But it, that, I think after that, that was kind of, because the way he took it, like, they went, wow, that's about a, bigger ribs you can pull on somebody and yeah. you know what like it was kind of initiation for him I guess you know he took they ribbed him they ribbed him and ribbed him he took it like a man he didn't bitch he didn't complain to the office he didn't do anything and then that time he face sucked that dude and took him down everybody kind of went leave him alone There's yeah nothing, you know he's all right you know and, wow how about Jim Hurd do you remember about Jim Hurd he was one of the bosses or something, wasn't he? Yeah. See, I was so low on a tone and pulled in, bro. I remember the name. I don't think I ever even saw the guy. Like the white hair? And yeah, the... I mean, I kind of know him, but okay. like, I never had any interaction with him. I was so low on a food chain that, you know, he wouldn't have had any reason to talk to me, you know? Mm. Now, when Ric Flair, Ric Flair left uh, and went to uh, WWF at the time, and right. he took the bell with him. Right. And some of the guys we've talked to, they they said they found it really disrespectful that Rick would take the belt like it was almost hurting them by taking food out of their mouth. When Flair took the belt up there, it wasn't that long after that that I got to go to New York and be Razor, and they and Razor was getting a big push, and so they put me with Perfect. You know, Kurt Hennig was he was on disability, so he was retired, and he was in a great spot. He was an announcer. He already had the reputation as being a great wrestler. So he was a kind of a liaison between the boys in the office. He worked with Vince on the superstar show as an announcer. He was with Heenan, he was with Flair, and they put me with those guys. So that's about as high as you can go on the heel totem pole at that time. Yeah. So, and I remember that now they, they did weeks and weeks of vignettes and raised before they go in there. And I'm, my dreams are coming true. They're going to push the heck out of me. And I'm really happy about it because Kurt has helped me from the AWA days, and he's continuing to help me. Now he's telling me, you know, how to get over with Vince, what to do in a ring, no wasted motion. You know, don't just do something because you can. You know, don't just do a move to a guy because you can. And like, he, he taught me, because back in those days, there were squash matches. You know, you'd have a guy from the audience against a guy who was getting paid to wrestle. And Kurt said, don't go out there and hammer a guy with a bunch of devastating moves because you got to wrestle for four or five minutes. He'd say, hit the guy with one thing and then just stand there and go, look at you now. Look at you. And I, I stole from Kurt to just pushing your toe on the guy just go, look at you. You know, because you don't want to keep hitting the guy with devastating stuff because you're killing your stuff off. Yeah. So Kurt taught me that. He said, everything you do has to have a purpose. No wasted motion. Don't run around. Always act like you know what you're doing. You know, like when you're in the ring, just... He taught me that you can't afford to buy that kind of TV time. Like every time you're out there, it's a commercial for you. Huh. So take your time, look in the camera, move slowly. But then when you do something, do it explosively, but then look around, because Vince's key, the camera guys are slick. They ain't gonna miss it. You know, yeah. They're gonna catch it. You do something cool, it's gonna be on TV. So he taught me that and just, 
But I remember that now I'm with the, I'm with Flair, Kurt, and, and Bobby Heenan, and so now my first angle is going to be against Randy Savage, against Macho. It's Machismo against Macho. So the in Hershey, Pennsylvania, now they set it up by doing it in Wembley at SummerSlam. They injured Randy's leg. So the whole storyline now is Randy has an injured leg, Flair does a figure four. They're going to take the strap off Savage and put it on Flair. Now we're in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and the angle is supposed to be they're wrestling. At a certain point, I'm supposed to go, uh, Savage is going to go to the floor. I'm going to come out. Vince wants me to kick him in the leg one time, throw him in. Flair's going to put him in the figure four. Randy's going to not give up, but pass out one, two, three. Wow. So we're there, and I'll never forget this. I'm standing there waiting by the gorilla position because I'm going to, you know, I have to go when I'm told to go. And I don't know if Vince did this to teach me a lesson or just because that's the way he, he felt. But they go out and they wrestle for about 10, 15 minutes, and he sends Heenan out. And he goes, go out there and get them back here. Because this is before live TV. Heenan goes out, says something to him. They both come back to the back. And Vince reads them the right act. What the F is that? You look like two jabronis out there. I, I, I told you to work his leg from the beginning. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm standing there going, whoa. That's Ric Flair and Randy Savage getting yelled at. What if I screw up? <laughs> 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 Holy shit. You know what I mean? I'm not sure the ink's dry on my contract yet. <laughs> Holy cow. And he's yelling at these guys are major players. And so he sends them back out. And tells him work his leg from the beginning. The whole storyline is his leg is injured, work his leg, work his leg, work his leg. So Rick does. They send me out, I kick him in the leg, I roll him back in. Rick goes another five minutes before putting the figure four on. Vince is furious. By the time the thing airs, I kick him in the leg, roll him back in, he's in a figure four. <laughs> and but I remember we're sitting in a when we're sitting in a little conference room talking about the meeting, you're talking about the thing with Flair and the belt, that's where this long rambling story is going, is that I remember kicking, when they're talking about doing it, because I didn't like Flair, because he was in control of my career when I was in WCW, and I didn't like the way he was treating me, you know? And so, and like at the same time, when you don't have anything, you have power. You know, Razor hadn't made a dime yet, so I ain't afraid to say, fuck you, Flair. Yeah. Well, you need to fire me, shuggle back to the strip club. And they're talking about doing a thing. Because I've been talking to Kurt about, man, wait a minute. How do we know we can trust Flair? You're going to put Vince's belt on Flair? He ripped off, he took Atlanta's belt. Like, this is the guy you want to carry your banner? I don't, because I didn't like Flair. So I didn't really want to play on his team. And I was about to tell Vince, you sure you trust this guy? Because he's the guy who fucked Turner Broadcasting. So I'm starting. And then Vince goes, is there any questions? And I was, and Kurt put his foot on mine and tapped me on the foot like, don't say anything. Because I was about to go, yeah, I got a question. You sure you can trust this guy? But Kurt gave me the office with his foot, so I didn't say anything. But that's my answer to you. I agree. I thought it was, I thought it was completely unprofessional and very wrong of Rick to take the belt. That's not the way Rick does business. Now, I don't know the backstory. Maybe they screwed Rick over and he felt the need to do that. I don't know Rick's side of it. I just know as a wrestler, that's the wrong thing to do. Like when we left, when me and Kev left Vince to go to WCW, we did jobs on the way out. We did jobs in Madison Square Garden. Nobody ever did jobs on the way out when they were high up. Yeah. You know what I mean? We didn't yeah. have to, but it was the right thing to do. We didn't want to screw the fans. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in WCW, what do you remember about your matches with uh, Brian Pillman when he was uh, the Dirty Yellow Dog? I never wrestled him when he was Dirty Old Dog, because he was a baby face and I was a baby face. Oh, okay. I thought uh, I thought you guys did wrestle a lot of some matches together. Well, maybe I, I... Yeah, when I was a jabroni, like, cowboy, like, mustache guy, and then I don't think as a diamond stud I ever wrestled the Yellow Dog. Okay. Brian was really talented, was getting a big push, you know. He was, he was a good guy, good talent, and, and they liked him. Yeah. But, like, my career was so... I was so low on the food chain then that every once in a while I'd be thrown in a match, but I was so, of so little consequence that I have no memory of any of that stuff. You know? Oh, okay. I know Brian did great. And actually that yellow dog thing was something that was ripped off that Barry Windham did in Florida. That's right, yeah. That's when, that's when it was done right. Yeah. When Barry did it, it was sweet. 
How did you come up with uh, the well? What was then the Diamond Death Drop, then later the Razor's Edge? I just was trying to think of a, just some kind of just a cool move. You know, actually, I think I stole it from Danny Spy. <laughs> Is that what Danny said? Uh, I forget. I don't think I don't think he did. I think because Danny had been working in Japan, and what I think Dan, what Danny did was one time I saw him pick a guy up for like that old style backbreaker like this, and I I was just trying to think of because I remember. When I was sitting there thinking, how come I haven't made it? I think I got a good body. I think I can talk. I think I have a good enough look. Why aren't I successful when all the guys I started with are successful? So I started studying all the dudes who were on top and looking for the common denominator. Not so much like stealing their moves or anything like that, but what's the common denominator? Because I was a huge fan of guys like Jake and stuff, Jake the Snake. So I went, okay, you got to have a, a look. Not everybody has to be a muscle guy, but you got to have your look. Yeah. You got to be able to talk. You got to have a couple of signature moves. And you got to have a cool finish. That's it. That's what all the top guys had. You only need three or four moves. Like Jake had just a couple of moves. So all I had was, you know, I had a sack of shit. You know, I actually started using that Razor's Edge Diamond Death Drop in Puerto Rico. Ah. I did it to Carlos Colon. Because that's where I just practiced because I went like this and a lot of the guys in Puerto Rico were littler and I was bigger then. So I just started just practicing and the first couple times I did it, man, I was landing on my elbows and stuff. You know, oh, I wow. didn't know what I was doing. I was dropping guys on their heads, but it was cool looking. I'll never forget the first time I did it, Bob, when in Atlanta and Bobby Eaton went, man, that's a cool finish. I wouldn't want to take it, but it looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like the, what I call sack of shit that they call it fall away slam or whatever. I was in the ring, I was working with Carlos Colon. And I said, duck the clothes on cross body. So I caught him and you know, gave him a sack of that. And I come back to the locker room and he goes, hey, amigo, what was that? He goes, you throw me like a sack of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, from, and from that moment on, it became a sack of shit. Like when I'm in the ring with dudes, I know I go duck the clothes on a sack of shit. You know? <laughs> but just, I just kind of developed that stuff in Puerto Rico because I really learned a lot in Puerto Rico about how to get over, you know, how to. You know, it's a real violent society, and to, to get over, you gotta be a badass. You can't be a cartoon. You gotta be a serious heel. Because I didn't want to be a, a ha ha heel. Like, like Chief J. Strongbow used to say, too much ha ha. Mm. Like, I didn't want to be a comedian, funny heel. I wanted to be like a serious badass. And so I learned a lot of that in Puerto Rico. Mm. Now, you said you, you were talking to Pat Patterson while you were in WCW. Right. Um, how did you finally uh, make, the, make the move? Well, okay, now he tells me, don't worry, in a year you'll be able to tell you want a job. Of course, a year, a year, your year goes by, and then, you know, I, I still have to call, and, and I'm going, well, I said, screw it. I called Kurt, you know, I called Perfect, I said, man, if I'm destined to be a job guy in this business, then I would rather do it in the WWF, because, because I said, get me Barry Horowitz's job. Huh, yeah. Because Barry Horowitz had a baseball card. I mean, everybody who worked for Vince was a star. You know, Virgil was a star. Guys who did jobs were stars. Everybody was a star. Some guys were higher up, but everybody was a star. So I said, if, if, I'm, if I don't have it to be a main eventer, I still want to wrestle, because even the lowest paid wrestlers getting paid, and I had no education, so I thought, I, this is what I, I still want to do this for a living. If I have to be a bottom guy, I'd rather do it for the best company. Yeah. So I told Kurt, give me Barry Horowitz's job. And one thing I noticed, I learned a lot when I was at working, you know, for Vince and then working, you know, at, at WCW. Sometimes, and Larry's back there, he can probably echo on this, is that sometimes you need guys who, whose wrestling is, is entertaining enough that the announcers can talk about other matches. They can talk about angles while these guys perform. Because Booker sometimes used to complain, man, they always talk about something else during my match. And I say, you know why, Book? Because you're so athletic and your wrestling is so aesthetically pleasing to watch that they don't have to talk about your moves because they speak for themselves. Mm. And guys like that, and you know, like that's how Brett was. Brett could wrestle, and guys like Benoit and Chris Jericho, and guys who are technically really sound, they're, they're wrestling, Eddie Guerrero, their wrestling is pretty to watch. You know, it's real, it's, you know, it's pretty. Yeah. So you don't have to talk about every move they make. You can talk about it, and later on, Hogan will be wrestling Sting, and blah, blah, blah. You can talk about the other angles during these matches. So, Brett had that ability, you know. He, everything he did was crisp and clean, you know. And, you know, if I owned a company, I would hire Brett. 
And I used to get in trouble in WCW for doing jobs for guys. Like, in fact, I did, we were, uh, I wrestled Chris Jericho in the Spectrum in Philly, and it was, it was leading into a match against L me against Lex Luger in Halloween Havoc, and Larry Zbysko was going to be the special referee. And Larry was announcing on Nitro that night. So Bischoff told me to just go out there, squash Jericho, keep hitting him with your finish until Zabisco comes to the ring, square off with Zabisco, you know, get something, get what you can out of it, then roll out of the ring. So I went to Chris and said, Chris, how many times have you been in the spectrum? He went, never. And I said, I've been here 200 times. And Philly's a, a tough town. I mean, it's a great town, but I mean, they they ain't gonna like lion hard Chris Jericho. Yeah. So I said, man, the only way we're gonna get any kind of reaction is if you beat me. I said, think of some cool way to beat me out of my finish. I said, come tell me later, don't tell anyone. And if anybody says anything to you after the match, tell them it was Hall's idea and I'll take all the heat. So we did it and he, Chris was smart. I picked him up like this for my finish. He kicked his feet off the turnbuckle, small package, me one, two, three, then I hammered him, then, ah. I, then I beat him on my finish, then Larry came, we did the angle, I thought it was way better. And when I came back to the locker room, Bischoff goes, didn't I tell you to go over? And I went, you didn't like it? Yeah, but didn't I tell you to go over? I said, you tell me you didn't like what I just did? I'm not saying I didn't like it, because Bischoff and me used to, he, you know, we, we had a crazy relationship, but he so said, I didn't say I didn't like it, but I thought I told you to go over. I said, man, I just thought it was my job to make this segment as entertaining as I could. Yeah. Oh, just never mind. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I don't know, man. I think I think it's it's television, and you're supposed to make it as exciting as you can. And if if you have to, you know, I felt the right thing to do that night in Philadelphia was for me to lose to get a reaction because I want my segment to be exciting and entertaining. Yeah. And I already knew that I had Larry Zbysko involved in it, which is a big deal. And I'm going into an angle against Lex Luger, who's a major babyface, and we're going into a pay per view. So I want my segment to be exciting. And I felt that was the right thing to do, you know. I'm not, I think I was, at that point in WCW, I was probably the highest paid job guy in the history of the business. <laughs> wow. How did uh, the whole jump to WCW come about and what was uh, Vince's reaction when you told him? I remember going to Vince, I'd been working there a while and um, I knew my position and I had no problem with it. Because I remember when I first started, Vince said to me, when I first started doing a raise events, Vince looked at me and said, you're going to make a lot of money. And I said, thank you. <laughs> and I said, you know, Vince, I don't have to have the most. I just want a lot. And he, uh, so I'd been there a few years, and, you know, my money was going up and up and up, and then it started to level off. But I'm thinking, no, wait a minute. I've been here a while, and I'm, I'm more of an asset now than I was. You know, I'm, I'm more over. My merchandise sells, people, you can leave me late every night and guess what, they chant Razor. You know, and so I feel like I'm pretty valuable to the company. I'm a, I'm a babyface who can do jobs and stay over. And so I asked for more money. I pulled Vince aside at TV one time and I asked him, hey Vince, can I talk to you about, about my money? I said, is there, I see, because I learned this from Kurt too, to how to go about it. So I said, Vince, can I ask you something? I said. Is there something that I can improve on? I said, is, do I need to improve on my ring work or um, uh, something that I can do better on my interviews so that I can make more money like the guys who preceded me? He went, oh, no, this, I'm absolutely, certainly pleased with your performance and your interviews are fine. I said, well, then I just can't understand why my money isn't going up. So the next thing I know, I'm summoned to Stanford to the office. Hmm. And I had to have a meeting and they double team, you know, J.J. Dillon and Vince sit there. And uh, I always thought they're real slick when you go in the office, like they, they phone the secretary, okay, Ray's is on the way in, so they flip all the posters over so that, you know, <laughs> flip the posters, Ray's is on the way, so all the takers, you know, all the things that have Undertaker on, they flip them, to, <laughs> flip them over to the Razor side. So, you know, you walk in your office and your posters are everywhere. And, and they, they brought a, they brought a, the secretary, like, right on cue, comes in and dumps a big thing of fan mail out. And Vince is going, look at the effect you have on people. People all over the world, you know, you touch their lives. And I said, Vince, you know, I'm my kids' favorite wrestlers, too, man. You know, I have two kids. I'm their favorite wrestler, and I'm never home. And Vince had a check on the table. I just glanced at it. He said, that's yours. Take it. I want to sign his contract. Three-year contract. 
Take it. That check's yours. It's yours today. Take it. Three-year contract. I said, Vince, I can't work your schedule for three more years. It was two years then, too. I said, I can't do two. He said, tell me what you want. One year. I said, uh, I want to think about it. You know, I said, Vince, I said, how about, I said, I ain't no mathematician, but I get my merchandise statements, and I said, if we move the decimal point a little bit over, I said, would the McPan family really notice it? Because the Hall family would notice. And he went, well, no, I'm not going to do that. You get the same thing that Taker and Diesel and Sean get. You get the same thing maybe in the future, but no, I'm no. Huh. So I went, huh, okay. Um, I said, how about Japan? I want to work for you, but let me have four or five weeks a year. I can go to Japan and get their money. See, it won't be your money, Vince. It'd be their money. Or like, see, because to Vince, before he went public, if you made more money, he made less, the way he viewed it, because it, uh, it was coming out of his pocket. Right. So I said, well, the fans' money, see, if they, if they buy Razor merchandise, that's their money. Or let me go to Japan and get that Japanese money. No, no. As soon as I had you over there, heck, I need you here. Huh. So I went, huh, okay. So Kid had been talking to Barry Bloom, this agent out in L.A., and uh, he represented Jesse Ventura. He, was, he never handled wrestlers before. He handled Jesse after Jesse was done wrestling, making movies. So I was the first wrestler that he, that he um, worked with. And Kid was talking to him, and Kid called me from his office, and because Kid was kind of feeling out WCW, and I said, "They're gonna pay you how much?" I said, "Find out how bad they want me." Because <laughs> Vince had you so busy working that you didn't even think anybody else wanted you. You got to go to Target and sign autographs for free, and then <laughs> drive, then drive 200 miles to the town, hoping wow. out late because you're gonna get yelled at. Yeah. You know, you, 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 I was so busy working, I didn't even know that there was a demand for me. I just knew, God, I gotta get to the town. Oh my God, I hope I'm not late. And so when uh, I gave my notice, when I got I got the offer, I signed a letter of intent with WCW, and then I gave my night. Yet Vince's contract was a one-year contract that rolled over every year. It rolled over if you didn't give a 90-day written notice, written that you not that you're leaving, but you don't want your contract to roll over. So I sent him a telegram, I sent him a letter, I said we we did it, covered all our bases. So then, as soon as I give my notice, I'm at some spot show in, in New Jersey, and Sean and Kev aren't there because they're doing public relations somewhere in Europe and their flight's late and they're not there. So now Razor's gonna work twice, Taker's there, it was a big, it was a medium sized town, you know, it's a pretty good house. But now Sean and Kev aren't there, so now I'm gonna work twice, I think Taker's gonna work twice, we're going to try to save the town. Mm -hmm. Tony Greer comes up to me and goes, uh, they want you to call the doctor. That means call the piss test doctor, Deepa Squally up in Toronto. So I go call him. His wife says he's not home. I go back, I start putting my gear on. Greer goes, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm putting my gear on, Tony. The doctor's not there. You know, he goes, well, uh, they want you to leave the building. I said, what? I said, now, wait a minute. What about this chain of custody we have where this is all confidential? I said, you're telling me you know the results of the piss test before I do? Ah. I said, that sounds a little kabuki-ish. I said, how you know you ain't going to tell me I got diabetes or something? Yeah. I said, you're telling me I'm dirty on a piss test before the doctor tells me? And plus, see, the piss test was six weeks old. Mm. Like, gee, and because when I, as soon as I said that, as soon as he told me that, I said, I guess they got my notice. <laughs> <laughs> and then Taker was sitting right next to me and he said, God, why don't they just push the guy out the door? Because it wasn't like I wanted to leave, but I didn't want my contract to roll over. Right. I wanted to say, Vince, like, I'm really serious about this talking. Let's talk money, like, seriously. Because I'm not a mark, you know, I'm not Bret Hart about, I don't care, if you give me a belt, you can pay me 400 grand a year. No, beat me every night, I want a fucking million. Yeah. And, I don't know. Wouldn't do it, so I, I took the money and went to WCW. Wow. Now, when you when you came in there, did they already kind of have the idea floating around about an NWO type of gimmick, or did? See, and what what happened so cool and it happened my accident was Kev's contract ended expired a week after mine, just because that's the way he came in. It wasn't structured that way or anything. That's just the way it happened. So which made it so cool for the angle down there. Yeah. Because I wrestled, I finished for Vince on a Sunday night in Madison Square Garden and I was on Nitro the next day. 
And it was Larry Zabisco's idea to have me come through the audience and interrupt a match that's in progress. Wow. And not it not hit the ring and beat the guys up. Just walk in and grab the mic like you would if, you know, the boys know me. They could have beat me up. They're not supposed to. They're having a match. I just grab the mic and go, hey, and I start talking. And yeah. they just stopped wrestling. And people were, what? And it was so cool and it was all Zabisco's idea because Bischoff would have had me walk down the aisle. I came through the crowd, talked, did what Eric told me to do. Later I told him I had a surprise for him next week. That's when Kev came. And the whole reason it worked was because people thought Vince sent us down there. Hmm. People thought we still worked for Vince. That's why it worked. Wow. Now, uh, was Hogan originally going to be a part of the group or how did that all come about? Well, in Hulk's contract, he has creative control over his character. That means he doesn't have to do anything that he doesn't want to do, which is a cool thing to have. I didn't have it, but Hulk had it, and he, you know, he deserved it. So we're at the Bash at the Beach in Daytona, and the show has already started. The pay-per-view's already started. Hulk is flying on a private jet from Cali to Daytona. So he's in the air. We can't get contact with him on the phone. We're not sure that he's going to do it because he's invested a lot of years into being a, a hero, being a good guy. We're not sure he wants to be a villain. He may not want to. But when he gets there, having seen the success that Kevin and I are having coming in, he's in Hulk smart. And his career as a babyface was starting to decline a little bit then. And he recognized it and he was smart enough to go, the only thing to do is turn. This is, and it was the perfect time. And plus, See, we were New York guys, me and Kev, and we just, as far as the people knew, we worked for Vince. Yeah. And there's no more identifiable New York guy than Hulk. So it was like, holy fuck, Vince sent those guys, we know Hulk and Vince from way back, those fuckers are going to take over Atlanta. That was the storyline, and it was Eric's idea. And Hulk agreed to do it, and it was Kev's finish that we did that night. And it worked. Um, what happened between uh, you and Jerry Sags in WCW in, in the matchup? Um, well, one of the things that happened that started a lot of the grief was Kevin and I were, got paid real well when we came in. And a lot of guys who were there um, took pay cuts. Now, not because of us, and we didn't know anything about it. But some guys were making like 350 grand a year, and they came to us, and they weren't working. Back then, they didn't even run house shows because they couldn't. They couldn't draw. And uh, so they said, we can't give you 350, but we'll give you 300. So a lot of guys agreed to it. Apparently, the Nasty Boys agreed to take a pay cut. And when they bitched about it, uh, the way I heard it was Terry Taylor said, well, you know, Hall and Nash get all the money. So right away, we got some heat. Right. And we get heat anyway. It's just, I get heat anyway. I don't care, you know. I, just, I like it, you know. But so we're heat seeking because we're obnoxiously happy. You know, we are, we're walking around smiling and laughing because we get paid and we don't care who knows it. And so what happened was, and I've known them forever. I knew them when they broke into Brad Rangan's camp in Minneapolis. And I consider them good friends and I still do. But it was, and what happened was, we were told to hit the ring, we're somewhere and they're wrestling some Mexican wrestlers. And we're, me and Kevin are supposed to hit the ring and, and lay them out with chairs. So I always go first because I'm faster than Kevin. So I slide in with the chair, I straddle one of the Mexican guys who's down, and I waffle Sags with the chair. And, and, and when I hit swing a chair, I swing it. Uh, to me, it's like, don't ask me to hit you with a gimmick because I'm gonna hit you. I'd rather not do it or I'm gonna do it, and I'll take it the same way. Right. right? I, don't, I don't do the eh, I send it. So I hit him, I didn't know that I'd potatoed him. He rolled out of the ring, and he had his back like this, and I thought he was feeding me. I almost hit him again from inside the ring to the floor because I thought he wanted another one. Because before we went out, Nas went, Let, make sure you lay it in, lay it in. <laughs> so what happened was, now he comes back and he's got a big goose egg on his head. And as and he's like turning the corner and I'm sitting there talking to Kev and I said, oh, Kev, man, I said, I potatoed sags, man. I said, I am so happy because I guess he was delirious and I thought he was feeding me for a second one, but I didn't do it. And I said, man, I am so happy I didn't hit him again. I said, I almost hit him again. I was kind of doing a nervous laugh. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, Sags turned the corner with a big goose egg. And he sees me and Kev going, <laughs> and he's thinking, they're taking my money. Now they're taking liberties with me. 
that got potatoed me on purpose and he thinks it's funny. This is the way I perceived that he perceived it because I've known him a long time. And so then, now we're in some other town, we're in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, something like that. And it's, a, it's, it's Ming and Barbarian, Nasty Boys, and me and Kev. And a, like one of those cluster six man, to me, three tag team deals. Yeah. And the finish is Kid, who'd wrestled earlier, is supposed to run down, throw us a gimmick, we're supposed to knock everybody out, keep the belts. Now, Kid got injured, so he doesn't come down. So now it's time to go home, and there's no Kid. So we're going, what is going on? Now it's, it's really getting out of control. So the Nasty Boys start throwing furniture in the ring. So they throw, Sags goes stomping down the steps, throws a plastic chair in the ring, comes stomping back down the steps. Now I pick up the chair. You threw it in the ring, you dummy. Yeah. So I pick it up. He comes walking in, looks right at me. I got the chair like this, and I did like, like Sabu does, like Kevin Solomon does. It's a plastic chair. He's looking right at me. I think he's paying attention. So I push the chair at him like that, and it hits him, and it rattles, and people go, ooh. By this time now, Ming is hitting me, you know, because we're the heels, and now there are other two teams who are like Bayface. So Ming's hitting me with working shots, and Sags is drilling me with live rounds. But see, he's stiff anyway, so yeah. I don't really think anything of it. He's like, bam, I'm going, whoa. And then Ming's hitting me with the working thing, and then bam, I'm going, man, wow. Finally, I look at him and I realize he's raging. He's mad. He's seriously mad. So I just pushed him away. Like, what's your problem? He knocked my tooth out. Did he really? I lost a tooth, man. He knocked it out into the fifth row. And it punctured my cheek. And you know, your mouth is so filled with bacteria that my face was like this and instantly. So I turned back around. You know, now, blah, 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 it's over. You know, then we finally get them out of the ring. I'm standing there. Me and Kev got the straps. We're standing there. I turn around to Kev and I go, Kev, is my face all messed up? He goes, what the F? And I said, it's Sags, man. And Kev goes, marches back to the locker, picks up Stink's baseball bat, and he goes, say the word, and he's dead. And I said, Kev, he thinks he's right, man. He thinks he's right. Because he thought that I was doing, that I was taking liberties with him again. Because Kev was going to kill him. Kev walked in there and just swung the baseball bat right above his head. I said, you want to find out who's got stroke around here, you mother effers. And then, you know, yeah. so I go to the hotel. We're all going to go out and party in Baton Rouge that night because it's a sweet little party town. All the Mexican boys, Ray Mysterio and Hoovy and Conan, they all come to my room and Kev. And I'm sitting there with this, my face goes sore and I can't laugh because it hurts. And they all go, come on, let's go out. I'm going, screw you. I ain't going anywhere like this, you know. And, <laughs> you know, and uh, they, so Bischoff calls my room that night and he goes, hey, God, I heard what happened, you know, oh my God, he goes, you know, he's fired, he's fired, I'll, I'll fire him instantly. I said, man, don't fire him. I've known him 20 years. I said, he's got kids. I said, I don't want to work with him anymore, but I said, don't fire him. And, you know, that was, and it, it, I think what happened was he ended up sitting at home for a long time and he got paid. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen him since then, you know, and it was just, it was, it was just something that happened, you know, it wasn't. I didn't intend to, for that to happen to him, and he intended to hurt me, which was wrong. I mean, it, the way I look at it is, if you had a problem with me, you should took it. You should have fought me in the locker room. Don't don't hit me with live rounds in the ring when I'm giving you my body. I mean, I'm leaning my face out there, and he's hitting me with everything he has. And when you're supposed to be that mad, like you can lift a car off a baby and stuff. Yeah. One thing I'm proud of: this dude's hitting me with everything he got, and he can't even knock me out. But that's what happened. Did Roddy Piper try and uh, go after you guys and try and fight you guys after a match one night? No. No? Because there was a story that Piper went in the locker room and, and had words with you guys. And The first time I remember Piper was, it was around, the, it was prior to, it was right before Christmas one year, we were making Georgia doing a Nitro, and we fed Piper all night long. Even when we went off the air, me and Kid just kept feeding him until he blew up. And then we'd roll back out and we'd, I looked at the kid, I said, you want to do it some more? And we went, well, it is Roddy Piper. And we went back in and just bing, 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 just making him because it was like, wow, it's Roddy Piper. Yeah. The only heat I remember having with Piper was Hulk saw me and Kev doing jobs for everybody all the time and it not hurting us. Like, we, we'd do jobs for guys, then we'd lie about it. We'd go, oh, I beat his ass. <laughs> and people go, no, you didn't, you lost, because I learned that from Kevin Sullivan. He would lose, and then he'd say, no, nah, beat him. And I'd be sitting at home like a Mark going, no, you didn't. <laughs> so that's what I learned is heels lie. 
You like you lose, put the guy over, then lie about it. So Hulk saw us doing that. So we talked Hulk, who doesn't do jobs, into letting Piper beat him at Starcade in Nashville with a sleeper. So Hulk put Piper over. He was so excited when we got in the limo that night going back to the hotel that he couldn't stop. He was he was so excited it made me feel great to see Hulk that happy. Yeah. Because he did a job and he was happy, you know. And we were going, yeah, see, isn't it fun? It doesn't even matter, man. Like, we're still the shit. We lost. Did you hear the people? Like, we put Piper over, man. Do you hear the people? Because if we didn't put him over, what are you going to do, a DQ or something? No, man. We're doing the whole Pat Patterson, Kurt Henning click idea. You're going to make the guy make him, man. He's going to beat you. Take his finish. Not some schoolboy or small package, but no, man. Let him beat you with his finish. So, the only remember friction I had was... When it came time for Piper to put Savage over in San Francisco at Super Bowl one time, they had to do the, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take the elbow drop. You know, he had to uh, get hit with the tape, you know, the brass tape, mm. the brass tape knuckles. And I remember standing in the, I was, me and Hulk were standing in the hotel bar and Piper and Bischoff were standing at another little table and I was buzzing and I was pissed off. And I fucked with Piper all night. I said, eh, Piper, I said, what's that tape do? I said, give you a rash or something? I said, you're too fucking much. I said, Hulk puts you over and you won't put Savage over? I said, I used to respect you. I thought, I think you're a jabroni. I said, I can't believe you, man. What is it, real? What, are we too close to Portland? I mean, I just went on and on and on. And the one thing I remember was Bischoff looking at me going, stop it, stop it. <laughs> 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 And, uh, and, and Hogan tell me later, he goes, wow, brother, no one's ever stuck up for me before. You know, because Hulk was always the man, so no one was ever watching his back, you know. Yeah. I said, you know, Hulk does a job for you, you won't do a job for Savage? I said, I don't get it, man. I said, what makes you so special? You know, I just totally, I don't know. I remember the, going into that angle, they did a thing that where Piper stayed in Alcatraz for a week because the pay-per-view was in San Francisco at the Cow Palace. And I said, I said, wow, you must have been real popular at Alcatraz. I said, I bet you got a lot of candy bars and cigarettes, you queer. And I just, I just, I really had a problem. That, that's the only thing I can remember about Roddy being pissed off at. But we, that blew over because he knew he was wrong. Yeah. But I don't remember him ever coming after us because if he'd come after us, he'd got his ass kicked. Do you think that the horsemen took it too seriously when they got all upset about the, the, the skit, skit you did? <laughs> well, yes, particularly Arn, because Arn got real mad because he said, oh, my wife told me you guys made me look like Otis the Town Drum. Okay, the thing is, Kev got that cooler that he used for the prop out of Arn's rental car. <laughs> he had Pee Wee, the referee who travels with Arn and Flair and their drinking buddy, get it out of the car. Arn is bitching in the hotel lobby bar, and I respect Arn, but this is the truth. He's in the bar bitching about it with two beer, with a beer in each hand, because that's how we do it, because by the time you get to the hotel bar after the show, it's going to close. So you've got to order, you know, the, the, she can't bring you beers fast enough, so you order two at a time, because, you know, by the time she walks back, you've already pounded that one, you know. So I just thought... <laughs> It's a skit, man. It's a parody. It's it's a joke. Like what? It, I I don't know. But see, then again, maybe you know, maybe my feelings would have got hurt. I kind of doubt it. I mean, they had Bischoff had me. He said, I got an idea. What we're gonna do is you're gonna be drunk on TV, you know, because you know it was it was my personal life. So we're gonna do it on TV. I said, Eric, I think it's in poor taste, but you're the boss, you know. The, uh, does, does it bother you that, that so many people know uh, that, that, that your struggles are so public that, you know, people print them in newsletters, uh, you know, it's acknowledged on, on television, where some other guys, you never know? Um, I never really was keeping it a secret myself. Um, I, thought it was, I thought it was a bad idea for Eric to do it as part of an angle, and the higher-ups in Turner made him stop after a certain amount of time. Um, it doesn't, uh, you know, I'm proud of my behavior, but I'm not, you know, I mean, I'm ashamed of some of the things I've done. I, I'm ashamed of, I hurt some people's feelings who didn't need their feelings hurt, but, um, you know, I, I try to look at something positive out of it, and if maybe there's one kid out there who goes, wow, man, you know, 
they just got all, you know, and he said, man, when he did the shoot interview of Feinstein video, man, he said, you know, you know, drinking ain't the answer, you know, maybe drinking and drugs, you know, I ain't gonna lie to you, it's fun, but you know, it, it ain't the, it ain't the, it ain't the answer. So, I don't know, I mean, I never was really trying to keep it a secret, I mean, because that's the way Kurt talked. Now that you bring it up, I remember every time when you would tag in Kevin Nash, you'd it'd be like, yeah. you want that big, you know, yeah. or we do the spot where I'd, I would put the guy over like crazy and then spit on him. <laughs> I did it to Stevie Ray, the Harlem Heat. Me and Kevin work with them, Halloween Havoc, and they're gonna drop the straps to us. So me and Booker start, me and me being, we have similar styles, we do some stuff. Stack Stevie in, I let Stevie toss me around, boom, 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 do his big man stuff, and then I go <laughs> and spit on him. And I don't tell him I'm gonna do it because I'm afraid he'll beat me up. <laughs> so I spit on him, and Stevie is a big, bad, proud black man. And people don't spit on Stevie Ray. And he went, and the people went, whoa. And then I went, <laughs> and reach back and tag Kev. Yeah. And then I go, now you're going to get it. <laughs> so Kev comes in, does some spots, and puts Stevie Ray over. And Stevie, and I've done that spot with a lot of guys. Stevie Ray was just so smart that after he boom, 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 bounced Kev around, he went over to me and went, Phew. I was standing on the apron. I didn't know it was coming. Wow. He went, Phew. he spit on me. And then I went, uh, like I tried to come in, tripped on the rope, did the flare bump <laughs> and a bun. But, and it was so cool. But I, had, I apologized to him afterwards. I said, Stevie, you know, I, I just popped in my head, although I had planned it. Yeah. <laughs> I said, Stevie, just see I said, please, you know, it's just, it's just a work. You know, I would never spit on you in real life. I respect you, you know, because I don't want you to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I was such a mark for the birds that that when Kev, Kid, and I became a package and we were in NWO, that's why I created Wolfpack. It was my idea because I wanted us to be the Wolfpack because we were going to be the new Freebirds. Ah. There's three of us. We're different, but we're like real brothers. We fight with each other, but if you mess with one of us, you gotta fight all of us. We, we don't dress the same, but we're the same colors. And, and we had like, they had free bird rules. Like they're the tag champs, but you never knew which two of the three were gonna defend the yeah. belts. And they all came to the ring together. Nobody else ever did that before. What, you know, that's what we did. Yeah. And, and we were Wolfpack rules. And, Terry Taylor, when we were working for WCW, the NWO stuff, used to go crazy because he was kind of working in the back. And like Kid would be wrestling, or I'd be wrestling, or Kev would be wrestling, and we'd all go out together. But he'd go, well, you guys are involved in the match, you're involved in the finish. We'd go, yeah, we know. But, but you're going out there together, you know, the people are going to know that you're going to be involved. We'd go, yeah, I know. Huh. <laughs> That's how we do it, man. Like, to me, if one of my boys is in a match, I'm going to be out there, because if he's winning, I want to be right there watching, and if he's losing, I'm going to help him. So why would I wait in the back? Oh, gee, he's in trouble? Let me run down the aisle. No, man, I'm going to be right there, because I'm old and I can't run that fast. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be right there at ringside so I can get involved, plus I want that camera time. I mean, it's just it's just how we did it, and we did it because I thought the Freebirds were the coolest thing in wrestling, and I was trying to rip off the Freebirds. And I feel really blessed that as my career went, you know, years later than when I got to be in the WCW and the NWO and Larry was an announcer, mm -hmm. I got to, like, at commercial breaks, I used to shoot angles with Zabisco. Like, we'd get a commercial break and I'd throw my toothpick at Zabisco and, you know, we'd square off and, it, and he's over. Yeah. And I used to tell Bischoff, this guy's a star, man. We can make money with him. And uh, I ended up doing it. He got a few pay-per-views out of the deal. He got some, so. Yeah. Uh, did, did it become frustrating to you, especially since it was your baby, when the NWO kept expanding and everybody was in the NWO? Yes and no. See, it, part of the problem was um, Hulk only made TV and pay-per-views. Now, Kevin and I made it every house show and TVs and pay-per-views. And we were under the impression that the NWO was going to be separate and that we were going to get the Saturday show. They used to have a Saturday show on TBS. We thought we were going to get the Saturday show, and that was going to be the NWO, and that me and Kevin were going to get to run it and with Hulk, and you know, and learn some of that behind-the-scenes stuff, and really make it cool, and do it black and white. Like we used to do empty arena videos and crazy stuff. And we wanted, because our idea was to make the fans decide: Do you like the NWO or do you like WCW? Instead of going, do you like WCW? Do you like WWF? We were going to try to make the mark, the fans choose between really one brand. You know, two brands but one company, and but really, we part of that was our fault because 
the one thing about having more dudes in the NWO is that means we didn't have to make every town. <laughs> you know, we didn't have to go to Little Rock and Sioux Falls and all that. We just went to the big towns and let the other dudes go to the other towns. But it did water it down. Do you think that WCW, um, whoever was booking at the time, mishandled Brett when he came into WCW? Um, I was just talking to somebody about that just yesterday. Actually, um, see, and with all due respect to Brett, his strong suit is his wrestling. He's not that good on the stick. He's not that good on the microphone. And everything we did was live TV. See, when he worked for Vince, a lot of his stuff was taped interviews where they could do several takes and get it the way they wanted it or they could feed lines to him or whatever. See, a lot of stuff we did was live and some of the guys were real good on the stick and if you weren't, too bad for you, we'd bury you because it's a cutthroat thing and if you don't remember, we'll remind you. So, Brett came into a, already a well-oiled machine and he he kind of didn't fit it. See, the thing is, too, there, Brett was made an offer a year earlier to come in, and he didn't want it. And then he came in later, and he didn't have the impact that he would have had he come earlier. And he just didn't fit. I think the thing that hurt him the most was that his, he, his microphone skills, you know, because the, we'd almost turned Nitro into, into a comedy. I mean, the NWO, we barely wrestled. <laughs> we'd open the show with some comedy, and then we'd do some run-ins, and then usually me or Kev or somebody would wrestle at the end of the night, but I don't know. I don't think anybody mishandled Brett. I just think, I don't think you can blame the management for somebody not getting over. I mean, Brett's been around a long time. He should know how to get over. You can't blame Bischoff because because Brett didn't get over. Do you think they pulled the plug on uh, Bischoff too quick when they replaced him with uh, Russo and uh, Farrar? Yes. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, Russo? No comment. Okay. I uh, think he's a great, a nice guy, a smart guy and everything. I, I think that he, he was a small cog in a big machine when he was successful with Vince. I don't know how he's doing at TNA or anything because I don't really follow that. He's a nice person. You know, I've never really done a lot of business with him. Yeah. Uh, how did it come out? How did it come about when you were finally um, released or, or you left WCW? I think it was the fateful German trip. Um, uh. I was dating a girl, Emily Sherman. Her uncle, was, Brad Siegel, is the president of TNT. And I knew Brad and his family and stuff. And Emily's a, is a real sweetheart, a real pretty girl. And we were dating, and uh, she, she was uh, part of the, your, uh, the international thing. So. We were in Germany, and I was at the bar, and I went to high school in Germany, and I traveled to Germany a lot for events, and you know I had a lot of German fans, a lot of German girlfriends, and this girl that I knew was in the bar talking to me, and Emily was there talking to me, and Emily and I had kind of decided that we, you know, we were not going to see each other anymore or whatever, and, and so I was talking to this other girl, and the girl wanted to give me a gift, and I have it at home. She made a doll of me, like out of a sock puppet like thing. It was a, kind of cool. I still have it. Anyway, this chick wanted to give it to me, but she didn't want to give it to me in front of everybody in the bar. She was real embarrassed. So we went up to my room and Emily used her authority as a WCW representative to get a key to my room and come in my room unauthorized. So then she came in. I'm there with the girl. Nothing's going on. The girl's handing me a gift, but Emily blows up and a food fight ensues and, and I'm, you know, drunk and, and so by the time, and, and we're up all night, now we've got to go to the airport and fly out. And now we, Emily and I are still bickering and stuff in the airport. And, you know, when you're on an international flight, you can't be real loud and stuff in the airport. Because in Germany, the guys walk around with machine guns in the airport, you know, security. So there's bickering and loud talk going on between Emily and I. And so they come to me and say, you know, you can't come on a plane because it's, you know, I'm going, well, just leave me alone, please, Emily, leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone, okay, blah, 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 and I'm sure a lot of it, you know, I, I'm not saying it's her fault, I've had, certainly had my share of it, but a big argument is to, I, they wouldn't let me on a plane, so I just went back to the hotel and flew home the next day or whatever, but that was the start of the end for me at WCW, just. Mm. But they teased that you were coming back and they did a couple angles and then Goldberg like went on TV and took what was supposed to be a contract with your name on it and ripped it up. Were there plans for you to come back or? 
I don't know. I don't remember hearing anything about Goldberg doing something like that. I know Goldberg didn't like me. I don't understand why. I helped him a lot. His first road trip, I, I helped. I said, ride with me. I get free cars. I get free rooms. And he wasn't anybody then. He was just starting out. But uh, and I introduced him to Barry Bloom, who ended up, you know, helping him get a really lucrative contract. Um, but I don't remember anything about that. Like when I barely watched the show, even when I was on it. Yeah. You know, so I had a lot of stuff going on outside of wrestling, and and wrestling was a release for me. Like I enjoyed performing when I was there in the ring and stuff like that. But I had other distractions outside of it, so I really didn't even follow what was going on, especially if it wasn't me or my buddies. Like I didn't really follow what Goldberg did, you know. So I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. Did you did you always have a plan, kind of in the back of your head, that once you got stuff situated, you would go back to WCW? Um, I don't know. I never went back there, did I? No. <laughs> um, no. I've been really blessed that, you know, I came from humble beginnings and I was able to save my money and then, you know, I saved the money from Razor and then, you know, WCW was really good to me and I saved money there and I made some investments that, you know, not all good. I got some property and, you know, I had good advice and uh, my goal was to just retire early and sit at home and, and you know, just do nothing. And I did that for a long time, and just recently, I mean, it's been just five, six weeks ago, I realized that the sit-at-home thing is not good for me. It's, it's, um, you know, too much time on my hands, I get in trouble. Mm -hmm. I, I get bored, I do stupid things. When the three of you guys appeared uh, on TV together for the first time uh, at the uh, pay-per-view and you did the promo, did you and Kevin kind of realize that it wasn't going to work with Hogan as a heel because he was so over as a, as a baby face? Which time you when we went to New York back from yeah. France, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it was different then because Well, it was cool because had it had it been done the way that we would have dreamed it had been done, Vince does stuff way better. You know, he stuff he just Vince could have made the NWO even bigger. But he chose not to. But it just I mean like the stuff we did were like when we got to the Rock in Chicago, mm -hmm. you know, we, you know, we beat him up, then we smashed it, the, the ambulance stuff. That's the way Vince does stuff, like Hollywood. And we were all going, "Whoa, this is cool." And that's about the last time we did anything. Yeah. You know, I mean, I got the, we did a few things leading into the pay per view. We were told weeks in advance, Hulk was going to put Rock over. I was going to beat Austin. Then a day or two before the pay per view in Toronto. Vince calls me in for a meeting, change the finish. So I remember going, what? Yeah, okay, no problem. You know, in other words, what, why did you call me? You're wasting my time. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't want to do business? In other words, you're a mark. You know, I don't know. I, I, I felt that I had been lied to and it just, I just wanted it out of there. I was happy I even made it to WrestleMania. Huh. So I told him, I, I told, I called Vince one time and said, maybe you better put Kev in the ring with Austin and let me stand on the outside. And I said, I ain't having very good matches with him. You know, I was, I was, I was an unhappy experience. Why do you think the chemistry wasn't there between you and Austin? Um, it got better, it, it got a little better, it just, um, I don't know, it's just like, uh, I didn't have my best matches with Steve and I'm sure Steve didn't have his best matches with me. You know, some people you click with, some people you just don't click with it. I'm not blaming Steven at all. He's a super talented guy, super interview. Um, it just, I don't know, just, it just, I would have liked to have seen Kev work with him and me on the outside and seen it, what they could have done. But I thought the match we had at Mania was, was okay. And it was, it was, uh, I laid it out. I called Vince and said, send me tapes of Austin. Let me see how he works in big shows. Because he starts with his comeback. And, you know, I don't know, this is what it was. I'm not knocking, I don't mean to knock Steve Austin at all. He's a major superstar in our business. I enjoy doing business with him. I was handsomely paid for it. It just, like I said, I didn't have my best match with Steve. I'm sure Steve would tell you he didn't have his best match with me. Yeah. Personally, he treated me uh, like gold. 